Welcome to NTD News, I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. Northeastern states are shoveling, plowing and thawing this morning after heavy snowfall and high winds covered the region in a thick snow blanket. Republican senators put forward their $600 billion counter proposal, but a new move by Democrats could even bypass the need for GOP support. Former President Trump's new defense lawyer says Democrats have turned impeachment into a weapon. He says it's their latest in an attack in a, in a relentless attempt to impeach Trump. And Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg praises President Biden's actions in a newly leaked video. Project Veritas says the person they're working with is still on the inside. Two FBI agents were fatally shot and three wounded while serving a federal search warrant in a child exploitation case. The tragedy tragedy occurred in southern Florida. The shooting happened around 6 a.m. in a middle-class neighborhood. Afterwards, law enforcement agencies swarmed the area in the Fort Lauderdale suburb of Sunrise. Two of the wounded agents were taken to hospitals to be treated and were in stable condition. The suspect was also killed during the standoff. The FBI says... He had, barric- he had barricaded himself inside a home. The scene was deemed safe at around 9 a.m., but officers still advised local residents to remain inside. Another large contingent of officers gathered outside a Fort Lauderdale hospital. And New York City residents are digging out from under more than a foot and a half of snow this morning, while northern New England states are still waiting for the winter storm's worst. The slow-moving winter storm pummeled the East Coast on Monday. Heavy snowfall and strong winds quickly shut down virus vaccination sites and schools, canceled flights, and halted public transportation. Snow piled up Monday from the Appalachians to New England. Up to 22 inches are expected for New York City and northern New Jersey. Parts of New England are bracing for a foot or more. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo declared a state of emergency in 44 counties, urging people to stay off the roads. According to a National Weather Service forecaster, the storm is the biggest in the city's recent history since the blizzard of 2016. Many pandemic-related service sites are opening back up Tuesday in New York and New Jersey, though at least 10 are staying closed. Cuomo explained all postponed appointments will be rescheduled when conditions clear. The National Weather Service warned high winds and snowfall could persist into Tuesday in New York and Wednesday in New England, but fewer flakes are expected. As the storm layered the northeast in snow, one truck and its passengers found themselves in a dire freezing situation on Monday. A partially submerged four-door pickup truck was found at Cummings Park in Stamford, Connecticut. First responders pulled two people from the vehicle, which was floating around 40 feet offshore. One woman standing in the truck's cargo area and another trapped inside the cabin. Three firefighters wearing cold cold water rescue suits and fire department's 100 foot tower ladder trucks aided in the rescue. No firefighters were injured and the man was transported to Stamford Hospital for further treatment. The incident is under investigation by the city's police department. Republican senators are trying to stay in the game on the next pandemic relief bill. Let's take a look at how their proposal compares to President Biden's. Nine Republican senators met with President Biden Monday to offer their counterproposal on pandemic relief. Their stands at about $600 billion, next to Biden's $1.9 trillion package. We have just had a very productive, cordial two-hour meeting with the president and the vice president and some of their key aides. Their proposals differ in other ways besides their overall size. Biden's plan includes $1,400 checks for Americans earning $75,000 or less. It's to top up the $600 checks sent out in December to reach the $2,000 Biden had originally promised. So far, this follows the line carved out by former President Trump. Trump was demanding $2,000 stimulus checks before he left office. The GOP plan offers $1,000 checks to a smaller subset of Americans, those earning under $40,000. The counterproposal offers $100 less than Biden's on unemployment. Its $300 weekly checks would run through June, and it offers no money to state or local governments. Biden also wants to raise the minimum wage to $15. The GOP proposal left this part out. The two plans have similarities, too, both providing vaccine aid and certain provisions for small businesses. It was a very good exchange of views. I wouldn't say that we 
came together on a package tonight. No one expected that. But the GOP senators remain hopeful to pass a relief bill with bipartisan support. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said after the meeting, the president had a substantive and productive discussion. Biden campaigned on his ability to reach across the aisle. Although Psaki said Biden sees a path forward which doesn't rely on Republican support. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer then brought it to the floor. He filed a joint budget resolution along with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi totaling $1.9 trillion. Which is the first step in giving Congress an additional legislative tool. Schumer said the resolution will provide instructions for the House and Senate committees to begin work on a potential budget reconciliation bill. The move drew criticism from Republican senators. Our Democratic colleagues are preparing to abuse the budget reconciliation process to ram President Biden's coronavirus relief proposal through the Senate. He says the motive behind the move is to pass the bill without the need for Republican support. Unlike the traditional legislative process, which is used for the majority of the bills that move through the Senate, there's no 60-vote threshold when you use budget reconciliation. Cornyn says Schumer shows no interest in playing by the existing rules. Former President Trump's new defense lawyer says the impeachment is tearing the country apart, and now is not a good time for that. Former President Trump's newly appointed attorney says Democrats are using impeachment as a political weapon. He says they're just trying to bar Trump from running for office again. Alabama attorney David Schoen speaking to Sean Hannity on Fox News. I think it's also the most ill-advised legislative action that I've seen in my lifetime. It is tearing the country apart at a time when we don't need anything like that. He calls it a slap in the face for the 75 million voters who voted for Trump's re-election. He says that's as about undemocratic as you can get. Republicans have criticized the impeachment for its lack of due process. It was completed in a single seven-hour session. The Democrat-controlled House voted to impeach Trump, presenting a single article. They allege he incited an insurrection that caused the U.S. Capitol breach. And that this is a very, very dangerous uh, road to take with respect to the First Amendment, putting at risk any uh, passionate political speaker. Scholars are split over whether it's constitutional to impeach a citizen who used to be a president. Schoen says he believes it isn't. He's a solo law practitioner who has offices in New York and Montgomery, Alabama. Former President Trump personally called on Schoen to head his impeachment defense team. Schoen says he considers it a privilege. Schoen says Democrat lawmakers have been set on impeaching Trump since his term began, and the upcoming trial is their latest attempt. The White House is reviewing whether to grant intelligence briefings to former President Trump. Presidents normally continue to receive briefings once they leave office. I've raised it with our intelligence teams, or our national security team, I should say. Uh, it's something, obviously, that's under review, but um, there was not a conclusion last I asked them about it. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff told CBS last month that Trump shouldn't get intelligence briefings. Trump's former Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence wrote the same in the Washington Post. She says it's because he intends to remain in politics. White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain previously told CNN that the Biden team would check with intelligence professionals before making a decision. The campaign to cut Trump off from intelligence briefings is part of a larger effort to ostracize him from the public and the government. House Republicans are facing backlash for voting to impeach former President Trump. One representative says his family signed a petition disowning him for the move, and another was formally censured by his state's Republican Party. And now there's even a political action committee targeting all 10 of them. Here are the details. Former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski is launching a new political action committee. This one takes aim at the 10 Republican representatives who voted to impeach former President Trump. The PAC would find and support the primary challengers to these 10 Republicans, starting with Congresswoman Liz Cheney from Wyoming. The vote to impeach Trump for allegedly inciting violence at the Capitol hasn't been popular within the Republican Party. And what's more, a Trump-backed poll shows 73 percent of Cheney's constituents don't like her. Illinois Representative Adam Kinzinger told Business Insider that his own family circulated a petition disowning him. In an interview with Insider, he said his family disowned him because he's, quote, in the devil's army now. 
And in South Carolina, the state's GOP formally censured Representative Tom Rice over his vote to impeach Trump. The party said trying to impeach a president as he is leaving office is, quote, never legitimate and is nothing more than a political kick on the way out the door. The impeachment trial in the Senate is set to start next week. Only five out of the necessary 17 Republicans have voted against Senator Rand Paul's motion declaring the trial unconstitutional. For this reason, Trump is likely to be acquitted. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Lindsey Graham says he won't hold a hearing next Monday. It's to confirm President Biden's nominee for attorney general. Senator Dick Durbin requested the February 8th hearing in a letter. Graham told his Democratic colleague that the timing was terrible. The Senate would be preparing to hold the impeachment trial of former President Trump the next day. Graham wrote in his response letter to Durbin that the trial requires the full attention of Congress. He said the process to select the next attorney general shouldn't be rushed through in one day. Democrats have the slimmest possible majority in the Senate, but Graham is still the chairman of the Judiciary Committee because the two sides have not worked out a power-sharing deal. Newly released footage shows Facebook CEO praising the new administration. The video from internal company meetings was published by Project Veritas. In a newly leaked video, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg praises President Biden's executive orders, many of which reversed Trump's previous actions. In his first day, President Biden already issued a number of executive orders um, on areas that we as a company really care uh, quite deeply about and and have for some time. In areas like immigration, uh, preserving DACA and ending restrictions on travel from uh, Muslim majority countries. He also mentioned Biden's actions on climate and advancing racial justice and equity. In the same meeting, the head of global affairs said there's been a lot of international backlash over Facebook's decision to suspend Trump from its platform. Ideally, we wouldn't be taking these decisions on our own. We would be taking these decisions in line with and in conformity with democratically uh, uh, agreed uh, rules and principles. Um, and. At the moment, those democratically elected, uh, democratically agreed rules don't exist. We still have to take decisions in real time. The company's VP of Civil Rights suggests all their products should take civil rights into account. I wonder whether or not we can use Oculus to help a white police officer understand what it feels like to be a young black man who's stopped and searched and arrested by the police. And I want every major decision to run through a civil rights lens. In a separate video that was recorded earlier in January, the VP of Integrity described how Facebook can target speech it considers dangerous. We have a system that uh, is able to freeze commenting on threads in cases where our systems are uh, detecting that there may be a thread that has hate speech or violence sort of in the comments. These are all things we've built over the past three, four years as part of our investments into the integrity space. We reached out to Facebook for comment, but they didn't get back to us by airtime. Nonprofit watchdog Project Veritas says the Facebook insider who leaked the videos is still at Facebook. New carbon emissions data is putting top climate official John Kerry in the spotlight. His family's plane emitted more carbon than 35 passenger cars do in a whole year. The Kerry family owns a Gulfstream private jet. FlightAware data obtained by Fox News says it spent just under 24 hours in the air over the past year. Based on an emissions calculator estimate, the plane sent out nearly 117 metric tons of carbon in that time. Compare that to the average passenger car at under 5 metric tons a year. The Kerry family also owned a private charter jet company, Flying Squirrel. Financial disclosures from 2013 and earlier show he seemed to have profited from the business through his wife. Estimates reveal private jets give off over 40 times more carbon per passenger as commercial flights. The data on Kerry's plane comes as Democrats look to overhaul the U.S. energy sector. It's an issue where failure literally is not an option. Today, uh, President Biden has said his climate plan would be based on the Green New Deal and could cost more than $1.7 trillion. The plan aims to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. A group of progressive activists and homeless people forcefully occupied a hotel in Washington state, demanding the county pay for emergency homeless shelters. We spoke with a city councilwoman about the takeover. At least seven people have been arrested for forcefully occupying Red Lion Hotel in Olympia, Washington on Sunday. 
A group called Oli Housing Now, made up of activists and homeless, occupied two floors. Some of the activists paid for one night stay, but then refused to leave, demanding that Thurston County use federal funds to pay for hotel rooms for the homeless. A press release from the city says some of the 35 activists were armed with hatchets, batons, and knives. One employee was allegedly assaulted, causing hotel staff to flee to the basement until police arrived. The Olympian reports that the Oli Housing Now organizer is part of a group called Olympia Anarchist Mutual Aid. Pam Roach, Pierre County's council member and a former Washington State Senator of 26 years, says she has intel that Antifa was recruiting homeless people to participate in the occupation two weeks prior. My intelligence tells me that they had gone、uh, into the homeless camps. Trying to recruit people, and they were young people that they were able to recruit to take part in this Antifa-backed occupation of this hotel. A similar occupation happened last month in Fife, Washington, when a motel was occupied by activists and homeless people for four days before police cleared it out. This time in Olympia, police cleared the business more swiftly, but there was still a delay of over seven hours while officers waited for a search warrant. This is unbelievable. So even in this case, while they did act quicker than the police in Fife, they certainly had a greater threat than the one in Fife. There were no weapons at that particular venue, and yet they are here sitting back waiting for who? For a politician to say, "Go ahead." She says she thinks many liberal politicians in Washington are reluctant to act because they are concerned about how they will look to their voters. Roach says she thinks this happened because during the first occupation in Five, the occupants were allowed to stay in the motel while alternative housing was found for them. She says if you coddle people committing a crime, they will be encouraged to do it again. This time they are more aggressive in that they brought weapons in.、Uh, they did have some resistance, but hours later, you have to get there immediately. If you call and you say to the police. I have an intruder in my home. I mean, you're kind of expecting they're, that they're going to be there right away. Over the last year, there has been an increasing number of anarchist groups occupying and/or damaging property in West Coast states. Yet these groups have often faced little or no consequences. Roach says because of this, there is a mass exodus happening in Washington. She expects it will continue unless something is done. Reporting by Grace Coulter, NTD News. And coming up, City Meals on Wheels in New York delivers food to the elderly. The organization is dedicated to the city's senior population who have been hit hard by the pandemic. And NASA reveals how its biggest Mars rover to date will land on the red planet. See the flight plan in action and more after the break. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us. Then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me, we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called. The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call, and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever. Just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call eight six six two three nine two six one nine today for your free copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's eight six six two three nine two six one nine. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis rejects an idea to prioritize prison inmates for CCP virus vaccinations ahead of the state's seniors. The Republican governor has pledged to make seniors' access to vaccinations a state priority. He said during a press briefing that Florida ranks first or second in the country for the percentage of seniors receiving vaccine doses. DeSantis said nearly 30 percent of the state's 4.5 million seniors are now vaccinated against the virus. DeSantis brushed off the idea of vaccinating prisoners over seniors. The death toll in the state's prison system rose above 200 this month. The website for the Marshall Project says Florida has recorded the most inmate deaths of any state prison system. 
The elderly are some of the hardest hit by the pandemic. But in New York, a food delivery nonprofit is making sure they get the nourishment they need. On a cold afternoon in January, delivery driver Andrew Smith goes about his daily routine. He's delivering nearly 100 warm meals to seniors in Brooklyn. Well, I've been doing it uh, close to 20 years. So I start like in the morning about 7. I go to the pickup, pick up the meal. Then it takes me about 20 minutes, maybe less. It all depends on how I'm moving. And uh, we're going our way. Beth Shapiro is the executive director of City Meals on Wheels. She says in New York City, prior to the pandemic, one in 10 older New Yorkers were food insecure. They're most vulnerable. They are susceptible. They can't go and wait in line at a grocery store or a food pantry. Um, they can't stand for that long, but they also are too at risk for their health. So the isolation is a huge issue for them. And this check at the door every day is a vital lifeline for them. The organization prepares fresh meals to be delivered to 20,000 elderly and homebound each day. Since the beginning of the pandemic started in early March in New York, City Meals on Wheels has delivered 2.5 million meals. Many seniors depend on City Meals on Wheels not just for food, but also for a little bit of company. If you go into their door, you just pick up the mail for them, the paper, put it at their door, a little closer, you know, because the pandemic going on and they don't want to come out. They also don't want to come near you sometimes. So, you know, you just do a little good deed for them, you know, you never know. So sometimes they see it and appreciate it. Good morning, my lady. The elderly are especially vulnerable in the global pandemic, but City Meals will continue its mission. New York City's mayoral candidate, Andrew Yang, tests positive for the CCP virus. Yang says he's experiencing mild symptoms, but feels good otherwise, adding that he'll be taking a break from the campaign trail as he quarantines for the time being. He says he'll follow public health guidelines. There's a new study saying the virus pandemic made people's faith stronger, especially in the U.S. NTD's Don Tran talks to a pastor on what it could mean for the nation's spirituality. Americans are getting back in touch with their spirituality. A survey from the Pew Research Center found that close to 3 in 10 U.S. adults say the pandemic boosted their faith, and about 4 in 10 say it tightened family bonds. Pastor Bobby Bledsoe says because in times of uncertainty, people turn to their faith. If you can't control your situation in the, norm, the normality as you used to, it tends to cause people to press into their deep-rooted belief systems. For Christians, Bledsoe says, the trials and uncertainty have brought them closer to God and to their families. We find ourselves um, more time together as a family. We find ourselves uh, less time doing things we normally would waste time doing. And according to the lockdown, we've all kind of been like that. So the survey also revealed that more Americans than those in other developed countries say the outbreak bolstered their religious faith. Bledsoe says that's because America was founded on Judeo-Christian values and it protects freedom of religion, unlike countries that practice socialism and communism. He recalls a time he preached in Cuba. And I told the translator to translate what I was saying and about the dictator that he, you know, and, and the translator wouldn't translated, he said to me, I can't say that because the government has spies in the church and you'll get deported and I'll go to jail. We're not allowed to talk about our, 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 our president, our leader. Some say faith during the pandemic has fostered both positive and negative outcomes. Regardless, Bledsoe says we all have a deep-rooted connection to a higher power. The pastor says he thinks the church could be persecuted for defying government regulations, but that it will also see its greatest hour. People who who had church that were dependent on personality cults or depending on, um, you know, you know, maybe fame. Maybe those churches in trouble. But I truly believe that God's not done with his church yet. And then God is going to raise up. I believe the Lord is going to raise up a standard. You're going to see the greatest hour the church has ever seen. And I believe people are going to respond in droves uh, to to what God does. A federal appeals court struck down state coronavirus rules in a California city that set specific church attendance numbers. But it upheld other limits on worship services in areas hit hard by the pandemic. Don Tran, NTD News. Parents in California want their kids back outside playing sports. One says it could lower the chance of kids getting infected with the virus. NTD's Andy Elsmore has more in Truckee. Parents and community members joined the Let Them Play CA rallies to stress the importance and benefits of children being in organized sports rather than confined indoors during lockdowns. 
Attendees pointed out mental health issues for children during lockdowns and how organized sports can mitigate virus spread under proper conditions. Youth soccer coach Aaron Abraham identified how organized sports with proper social distancing measures keep community infections down. We had no transmission that we were aware of with sanctioned practices. Abraham referred to transmission of the CCP virus, also known as COVID-19. He said that keeping kids inside resulted in children wanting more social interactions with less concern for social distancing. When we weren't giving these kids this opportunity, they were at the skate park unsupervised. They were having friends at their house because these kids are looking for social outlets, especially high school age kids. So. He said the key was having adults and parents provide organized events for kids. So when we actually gave them access to an organized uh, events where we could actually monitor and help with social distancing, it worked great. Let Them Play CA co-founder Kristen Hensley cited the safety of properly organized sporting events. She said, over 40 states have let their children play sports safely and all the data collected shows that these sports succeeded in providing healthy activities for our children while not spreading COVID-19. Abraham also cited an increase in children's mental health issues during lockdowns. The health and safety of these kids are not very good right now social disorders, anxiety, depression, suicidal tendencies are up, uh, drug and alcohol abuse for some of our high school kids. And he said the rallies are an opportunity to have an objective conversation about children's health and well-being. The January rallies were held in over 83 counties and received support from over 50,000 student athletes, parents, and coaches. Reporting by Andy Elsmore, NTD News, California. The U.S. Coast Guard offloaded more than $211 million worth of cocaine and marijuana in San Diego on Monday. The drugs totaled roughly 11,000 pounds of cocaine and 9,000 pounds of marijuana. The drugs were seized in international waters in the eastern Pacific between October and December. Personnel on board the USS Gabriel Giffords and three separate Coast Guard cutter crews confiscated the substances. NASA's biggest, most sophisticated Mars rover ever is nearing its destination. The space agency on Wednesday previewed how, the, how its latest Martian explorer will land. NASA scientists are calling it the seven minutes of terror. In that time, the craft will go from 12,000 miles per hour to a complete stop. Mars's atmosphere, a 70-foot parachute and rocket-powered jetpack will help put the brakes on and maneuver it for a gentle touchdown. Entry descent landing is the most critical and most dangerous part of the mission. Success is never assured, and that's especially true when we're trying to land the biggest, heaviest, and most complicated rover we've ever built to the most dangerous site we've ever attempted to land at. The rover's landing site won't make it an easy job. Perseverance will aim for Jezero Crater, a treacherous, unexplored area of boulders, cliffs, dunes, and possibly rocks. Based on chemical signatures, it may have been home to a lake over three billion years ago. A magnificent place for science. But when I look at it from a landing perspective, I see danger. It's a formidable challenge. The car-sized vehicle is bristling with cameras, microphones, drills, and lasers. Powered by plutonium, the six-wheeled rover aims to collect tiny geological specimens. They're scheduled to be brought home to Earth in 2031, with help from the European Space Agency. Perseverance began its journey to Mars in July last year, blasting off from Florida's Cape Canaveral. The rover will arrive on the Red Planet on February 18th. And just ahead, parts of several major rivers in China turn red. That and more after this short break. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslane and perillocetes, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7 and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritan Omega-3 does not smell of fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritan Green Vegetable Omega-3. Eat two a day and you'll feel brand new!
Reports say the U.S. government gave people virus tests from a Chinese company affiliated with the Chinese military. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on why some lawmakers want this investigated, and it has to do with your DNA. Was your virus test made in the USA or China? Reports show that two federal agencies, including Health and Human Services, gave out virus test kits from Chinese genetics company BGI, a company that's worked on projects with the communist regime's military, the People's Liberation Army. But this company offered to take it a step further. According to 60 Minutes, documents show that BGI offered to set up a testing lab in Washington state. A special agent for the FBI told CBS that this is concerning because the Chinese regime's strategy aims to collect data, and they want your DNA. They are building out a huge domestic uh, database, and if they are now able to supplement that with data from all around the world, it's all about who gets the largest, most diverse data set. And so the ticking time bomb is that once they're able to achieve true artificial intelligence, then they're off to the races in what they can do with that data. Basically, DNA is a map of a person's characteristics. This includes susceptibility to diseases. Like the agent said, the regime is already doing this in China. Reports say Chinese authorities forcibly collect blood samples from Falun Gong practitioners and Uyghur Muslims, which are used to refine their mass surveillance systems and improve their ability to track down a target's family members. The U.S. has blacklisted subsidiaries of BGI, that Chinese genetics company, for helping with the project. Yet their virus tests got into the hands of the U.S. government and were then used on Americans. Those companies were uh, identified to have been facilitating the collection of of genetic information of ethnic Uyghurs. If anything, that should serve as a warning signal for all of us that that is potentially what can happen if our data gets out of our hands, how it could be used. Republican Senators Marco Rubio and Chuck Grassley are asking an inspector general to review the actions of Health and Human Services and their work with BGI. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. In China, the waters of several major rivers are turning red. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more details on what's behind the unusual sight. Certain parts of three rivers in China have turned red recently. This is apparently due to high concentration of a rare metal. One of the rivers is Jialing River, a tributary of the Yangtze River. Abnormal thallium concentrations have been detected and the rivers appear red. Thallium concentrations in these rivers reportedly exceed the standard by 1.7 times. Thallium can be used as a strong nerve poison and cause acute poisoning. Chinese authorities reported last week that the pollution is caused by pollutants from two metal-producing companies. Rainwater in the factory area apparently pushed the thallium-containing pollutants into the rivers. A team of experts from the World Health Organization are getting to work in Wuhan. So far, they've visited hospitals and local markets after two weeks' mandatory quarantine. Over the weekend, the team inspected the seafood market, thought to be at the center of the initial Wuhan outbreak. They were there for about an hour. Public access to the Huanan seafood market has been restricted since its closure early last year. The experts also visited a hospital that treated early CCP virus patients. Doctors at Jingying Town Hospital had collected samples from patients sickened in late 2019. Journalists have been kept away from the WHO-led group since members were released from hotel quarantine. The team's full field work itinerary has not been released. Journalists have been spotted driving behind the WHO experts' vehicle in order to find out where they're headed. The team is in the city to investigate the origins of the virus. They reportedly focus on analyzing research done by the Chinese side. The current trip won't include conducting independent studies. The WHO said team members would be limited to visits organized by their Chinese hosts and that they wouldn't have any contact with community members or relatives of virus victims, citing health restrictions. China reports a radical drop in cell phone accounts last year, a whopping 5 million. This raises doubt over the real number of virus deaths in the country. China recorded a drop of 5 million cell phone customer accounts in 2020. That's according to data from the country's three largest cell phone operators. The three dominates the Chinese market. The drop is quite unusual. That's because phone accounts increased by over 60 million in 2019 and 120 million in 2018. 
Chinese authorities said earlier last year the drop in phone accounts may be caused by a slowing economy, but the regime reported a 2.3 percent year-over-year GDP increase in 2020. Authorities also said some Chinese people have multiple phone accounts. Some may have canceled their second accounts during the pandemic. But the demand for phones actually increased since the beginning of last year. That's due to the regime's virus monitoring policies. These policies have made cell phones necessary for almost every single person in China. In order to go to work, take public transport, or even buy groceries, people in China have to show a so-called health code on their phones. It shows their testing result and travel history. The policy has forced many elderly people and children to get phones. So why has the number of phone customers decreased so much despite the increase in demand? The sharp decline may hint at more CCP virus death than Beijing admits. Many have long questioned the official number reported by the CCP. With a population of over 1.4 billion, the country reported fewer than 5,000 deaths. That's a strikingly low rate compared to other countries. Italy, for example, has a similar proportion of elderly people and a more advanced healthcare system, but the country's mortality per 100,000 people is over 400 times more than that of China. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Up next, Britain is feeling negative effects on trade following its break with the European Union. Overwhelming paperwork is reportedly affecting product flow. Find out more when we return. EU antitrust enforcers claim a court made legal errors in a ruling. That's when it got rid of their order for Apple to pay over 15 billion dollars in Irish back taxes. The European Commission is cracking down on what it sees as aggressive tax planning by multinationals. In its 2016 findings, the Commission claimed two Irish tax rulings artificially reduced Apple's tax burden for over two decades. In 2014, it was as low as 0.005%. The commission is appealing to the Luxembourg-based Court of Justice, part of the European Union. The general court ruled last year that the EU executive had not met the required legal standard to show Apple enjoyed an unfair advantage. Apple said in a statement that it has always followed the law. Home prices in Seattle are climbing at a faster rate than almost anywhere in the United States. Entity's Echo Liu reports from Washington State. Home prices in the Seattle area are rising as the second fastest in the United States, according to the latest data. The S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller Index released on Tuesday. The year-over-year -year increase for Seattle housing remained high, and only second to Phoenix in November. Prices in Seattle climbed 12.7 percent in 2019, about 1 percent lower than Phoenix's 13.8 percent. San Diego ranked the third with a 12.3 percent jump. Seattle's upsurge in November was higher than the 11.7 percent increase in October. And the growth rate exceeded the national average of 9.5 percent. It is Seattle's 10th consecutive month in second place. Affordable home prices rose faster than the more expensive ones in this region. Experts say low interest rates and intense competition contributed to the demand. According to a Zillow economist, 2020 was a record-breaking year for the housing market, with intense competition among buyers driving up home prices. Shifting to remote work also opened up more housing options for Seattleites. In the past year. The housing market gained $73 billion in value and ranked as the seventh most valuable market in the U.S. in 
Zillow predicted home values will likely continue to rise in 2021. Echo Lil, NTD News, Seattle. A cyber attack may have exposed personal data from more than one and a half million people in Washington state. The state's auditor's office says the hack targeted 1.6 million Washington residents who filed for unemployment in 2020. The data includes names, social security numbers, driver's licenses, bank information, and employment details. State officials say it happened on December 25th through a, through a third-party service provider. The agency is working with law enforcement and the attorney general's office to investigate. JetBlue is setting up a premium service for flights to Europe. It's in preparation for when international flight restrictions loosen up. JetBlue plans to start new transatlantic routes with premium suites and studios for business class at what it says will be reasonable fares. The airline says its new Airbus will offer suites with sliding doors and private studios, complete with custom seats that are like beds in the sky. JetBlue has applied for gates at Gatwick and Heathrow airports, but there are no details yet on flight schedules or actual pricing. Britain's departure from the EU has triggered the biggest change in trade since it joined the bloc 48 years ago. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson pointed to some problems. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Since Brexit, you're no longer allowed to take certain foods to Europe, like uh, uh, meats, uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, fishes, and those kinds of stuff. This has been the impact of Brexit so far. Paperwork, long delivery times, and higher prices. Welcome to the Brexit, sir. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Britain's departure from the EU has triggered the biggest change in trade since it joined the bloc 48 years ago. It is the case that in the weeks ahead, we expect that there will be significant additional disruption, particularly on the Dover-Calais route. There are problems at the moment caused by uh, teething problems, people not filling in the, the right forms or misunderstandings. According to real-time truck movement data, freight volumes moving between the two dropped 38% compared with the same time in January last year. Here's why. Fishermen were the first workers to be hit, presented with a barrage of new health checks, certificates and customs declarations. That delayed the movement of stocks to such an extent that they were rejected by European buyers as no longer fresh. In 1973, Ted Heath, um, he sacrificed fishing to get the deal to go into Europe. Coming out of Europe, um, Boris has done the same, but it's worse this time. Since then, other food producers, from cheese to high-end beef, have also been hit. About a fifth of small to medium-sized businesses have stopped exporting to Europe for now, put off by costly and overwhelming paperwork. This, we have this one, we have this one. We are rebuilding supply chains already. You know, you're seeing these boats come from Rosslare. Um, you're probably, um, there's some of the unaccompanied haulers already in advance of this, of um, increasing their fleet of, of trailers. Um, you know, so you're going to see a big shift away from Dover, I think. You know, people built their businesses around that free-flowing channel. And so just to put it up overnight, it's really going to hurt some businesses. The friction is forcing some companies to rethink their supply chains, particularly British firms that risk tariffs by selling goods into the EU that were made from materials originally imported from Asia. Online clothing giant ASOS, for example, expects a $21 million tariff hit, while Japanese car maker Nissan plans to source more batteries from Britain to avoid tariffs on electric cars. Probably the most obvious impact can be seen in the ports. Ireland used to ship via Britain as it was speedier, but large ferries are now shipping goods directly between the EU member and the rest of the bloc, cutting out paperwork and delays. In Ireland, gaps have begun appearing on supermarket shelves as retailers struggle to cope with the customs paperwork. It's a situation that could deteriorate after a three-month grace period for Northern Ireland supermarkets expires. Up next, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he can't give concrete dates for lockdown lifting as infection and hospitalization rates are still very high. Find out more when we come back. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fight it out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America. 
and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. And now let's go over to Europe. New cases of the CCP virus in the UK hit a seven-week low, but community cases of the South African variant are triggering mass testing in eight areas. Neil Woodrow in our UK newsroom will bring us more from Europe. Prime Minister Boris Johnson defended his decision not to ease restrictions. While infection and hospitalization rates are falling, they are still at too high a level, he said. High level. And so the risk is if you take your foot off the the, you know, the, uh, the throat of the, the beast, as it were, if you allow things to, to get out, co out of control again, uh, then you could, alas, see the, the disease spreading again fast before we've got enough vaccines into people's arms. Johnson is expected to release a plan for easing the lockdown at the end of February. The pandemic is impacting our daily lives and how we handle death. Funeral workers in East London told entities Jane Werrell what it's been like to support those who've lost their loved ones. Funeral workers are often not recognised as being on the front lines of the pandemic. In times where we have this national pandemic, it has been exhausting. This company in London say their workload has been double than normal. This second wave, these last few months, have seemed worse than this time last year, like March last year. There are also cases of perfectly fit people um, catching COVID and not coping, which I don't think we saw here in that first wave. Not too long after we arrived, a Ugandan family mourning their loved one. They agreed we could film as they left. They looked at it that their mother would feel it's important that the story is told. You know, the mere fact that her life was cut short through COVID. This is something to be taken seriously. He said they treat every case as if it's COVID related, while ensuring families pay their respects to the deceased within the guidelines, catering for different cultures and traditions. But it's so, much, so important to sort of keep our normal practice going. That is the ritual washings for Hindu and Sikh families. Under government guidance, funerals attendance is kept to 30. They work long hours supporting families through the grieving process. Our profession has always sort of been in the background of society, um, never, never really acknowledged until it's needed. Um, but that's just it's the nature of the profession itself, it's the nature of the job, um, which we understand. Suddenly a war comes along and, oh, I don't want to get hurt and let's all run away and let's all hide. Well, that's not the way it works. And the funeral trade's like that. They'll carry on their roles so those who are lost are not forgotten. Jane Worrell, NTD News, London. Concerns over theft of intellectual property may stop thousands of Chinese academics and researchers from being allowed to enter the UK. According to the Times newspaper, the measures come amid growing concerns about Chinese students, academics and researchers acquiring technology that could benefit China's army. The Foreign Office will introduce security vetting in 44 areas relating to national security. These include artificial intelligence, chemistry, physics, maths and computer science. For those who already are working or studying in the UK, their visas might be revoked if they are deemed a risk. Visa applicants will have to disclose extensive background information and details of their proposed research area. Sunday morning, Parisians saw about 700 vintage and classic vehicles during the 21st Winter Paris crossing. Buses, motorbikes, cars and even tractors made their way proudly along the beautiful streets. The 20-kilometre route takes the annual motorcade past many famous Parisian landmarks. Sitting next to his dad in their jeep, this student expresses his delight. 
It's just this, living in the moment, breathing fresh air, driving down the world's most beautiful avenue in an old car. That's enough for me. <laughs> the participants gave up their usual group gatherings in order to observe social distancing measures, but they're still being allowed to stop along the itinerary. That's all for today from NTT TV UK News. See you tomorrow. Still to come, teams Rough and Fluff get ready to battle it out at the Puppy Bowl this Sunday. This year's game will go on, but with additional safety measures. That and more after the break. Punxsutawney Phil predicts six more weeks of winter this year. He emerged from his burrow this snowy Tuesday morning to perform his Groundhog Day duties. The furry critter woke around 7.30 a.m. at Gobbler's Inn in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. With help from members of his inner circle, a group of local dignitaries who help carry on Groundhog Day traditions. That's to find out whether he would see his shadow or not. According to folklore, if he sees his shadow, there will be six more weeks of winter. If he doesn't, spring comes early. Shortly after Phil gave his prediction, one of the Inner Circle members shared a message that he said Phil had told him earlier in the day. After winter, you're looking forward to one of the most beautiful and brightest springs you've ever seen. This year's Groundhog Day spectacle was held virtually with no in-person visitors, but it included cardboard cutouts to represent the occasion's usual crowds. While many are getting ready to watch Super Bowl 55 this Sunday, others are preparing for the game's canine counterpart. The Puppy Bowl. Get ready for unbearable cuteness. Puppy Bowl 17 kicks off on Discovery Plus and Animal Planet on Super Bowl Sunday. Once again, teams Rough and Fluff face off in battle for the Chewy Lombarki Trophy, with veteran referee Dan Satcher making the calls. Who's down there in the end? Producers said they were going to figure out a way to host their annual game, even if there wasn't going to be a traditional Super Bowl. Due to the pandemic, the stadium will only hold 22,000 attendees, a third of its capacity. The Puppy Bowl is also adapted. We had to figure out a whole new way to shoot the show. We can't shoot the show in a studio in New York City. It's far too crowded. We couldn't have shelter reps fly puppies from across the country. We had to make sure they could drive to Puppy Bowl this year to keep everybody safe. Hey, Chunky Monkey. The animals featured in the game all come from various shelters across the country. According to Discovery, Puppy Bowl is 16 for 16 with an adoption rate at 100%. All puppies and kittens featured in Puppy Bowl to date have found loving homes. Everyone got tested before they came. We tested everybody the first day of the shoot. Everyone has PPE and is wearing masks at all times in all areas. And we're socially distancing even for crew meals and doing everything we can to keep everybody safe. Fans watching the game can vote for their favorites in the Popularity Playoffs Bracket style tournament on PuppyBowl.com. That's all for now. Thanks for tuning in. Watch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan. Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.